You use it every day. I use it every day and so do people all over the world. But did you know that it was invented in Germany? I didn't either. So it's about time that we talk about these five major inventions you didn't know were German. Hello, servus, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Feli. I'm originally from Munich, Germany, but I've been living here in Cincinnati, Ohio, on and off since 2016. And as a German living abroad, I noticed that my home country is actually brought up a lot more often than I ever would have expected. I mean, I did expect for Nazi history to be a topic that would come up, but I found that even in conversations about cultural topics, American history, technology, the economy, Germany somehow always plays a role. And I was reminded of that yet again when the Barbie movie and Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer came out last month. So it's definitely time for a part two of major inventions you didn't know were German. In part one from a few months ago, we already learned that we wouldn't have MP3 today if it wasn't for a German research team or x-rays or fridges, just to name a few. Make sure to check out the full video to have your mind blown, but the list is much longer. The first invention for today is aspirin, or in German, aspirin, which was invented by the German pharmaceutical company Bayer in the late 1800s. Aspirin is the brand name that Bayer gave the medication, but the active ingredient is acetyl salicylic acid, which is why it's also often referred to as ASA or ASS in German. It can reduce pain, fever, inflammation, and as was discovered in the 1950s, it can also help prevent blood clots. Technically, humans have been using plants that were rich in salicylic acid, such as willow bark, for thousands of years, but it wasn't until the 19th century that chemists tried to isolate and synthetically create the acid. The final breakthrough took place in the bio lab in Eberfeld in the year 1897. The young pharmacist and chemist Felix Hoffmann was hired to create new drugs in the lab. He worked under Arthur Eichinger and they're different versions of the story, but according to Bayer itself, Hoffmann's father was suffering from rheumatism and complained about the bitter taste of the salicylic acid that he was taking to reduce his symptoms. It also burned the lining of his stomach and mouth, which is why his son tried to find a way to reduce the side effects of the medication and discovered that when he mixed it with acetic anhydride, Essigsäure, it became much easier to stomach. Bayer then registered a trademark for the new medication under the name Aspirin in 1890. 99 and started selling it around the world. First as a powder in glass bottles, but then they started pressing it into standardized pills and added the Bayer Cross logo. The name Aspirin is a blend of A for acetyl and Spear or Spear from Spirea, which is the plant genus from which the acetyl salicylic acid, that's a complicated word to say, was originally derived from. And then they added the common chemical suffix in. Aspirin. But only about 20 years after aspirin first hit the market, Bayer actually lost its trademark in the US and in many other countries, which is why at American drugstores, you'll see the name aspirin on a lot of products by manufacturers that aren't Bayer. By the way, only 11 days after Felix Hoffmann synthesized aspirin, he also synthesized heroin, heroin in the Bayer lab. He wasn't the first scientist to make heroin, but it led to Bayer commercializing it in the following years and marketing it as a cough suppressant and non-addictive substitute for morphine. The name was derived from the word heroic, or in German heroisch, and it was sold for 15 years up until 1913, when it had become pretty clear how addictive the drug is. Next up is an invention that has been very present in the public discourse recently, because it was the main topic in Christopher Nolan's movie Oppenheimer that just came out, nuclear fission and the atomic bomb. Those of you who've seen the movie might remember the scene where Oppenheimer first sees the newspaper headlines that the Germans have had a major breakthrough and actually split an atom. After scientists had been researching the nature and properties of radioactivity and radioactive substances for over 40 years, the German chemist Otto Hahn and his team discovered nuclear fission in December of 1938 at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Chemistry in Berlin. They had been bombarding uranium with slow neutrons and discovered that barium was produced, so another chemical element, which suggested that the core of the atom must have burst. This discovery showed that nuclear chain reaction was possible, which laid the foundation for both nuclear power 
and also nuclear weapons. A few years later, in 1944, Hahn actually won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the discovery of nuclear fission. Now, right after this news first broke, the physicists at the Radiation Laboratory at the University of California, Berkeley, started experimenting with this. And this is where Robert Oppenheimer, one of the leading theoretical physicists at the time, was teaching. And a couple years later, in 1942, he was recruited to lead the research of the Manhattan Project with the goal of creating the world's first atomic bomb in order to defeat Nazi Germany and end World War II. And even though Oppenheimer was born in New York City, his family was originally from Germany. That's also why his name sounds so German, Oppenheimer. His father, Julius Seligmann Oppenheimer, was from a Jewish patrician family in Hanau, which lies in today's German state of Hesse, but at the time belonged to the Kingdom of Prussia. He came to the US at the age of 18, where he met his future wife, Ella Friedmann, who was the daughter of Jewish immigrants from Bavaria. And even Robert Oppenheimer himself lived in Germany for a while in the 1920s, when he got his PhD at the University of Göttingen under Max Born. So lots of German influence there when it comes to nuclear fission and the atomic bomb. Not to forget that the whole motivation to even build nuclear weapons was to fight the Nazis, who were believed to be working on nuclear weapons themselves. So whichever way you look at it, it all traces back to Germany. In good ways and in very bad ways. Now, one thing that was invented in Germany, but that you can access all over the world is Lingoda, where you can learn languages online and live with experienced native level teachers. When Ben and I went to the Dominican Republic recently, it really bugged me that I didn't speak any Spanish. I only learned English and French in school. And even though I really tried, this was all I could really say by the end of our vacation. Quiero ordenar un mojito. Uno. 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 E, e, e. I mean, better than nothing, I guess, but I really want to be able to communicate in Spanish. And Lingoda is giving me that extra motivation that we all need with their two month sprint challenge, where if you complete the challenge, you can earn 50% off your money back, or alternatively, get Lingoda class credits that are worth two and a half times the monetary cash back. The sprint is an intense language learning course that will immensely boost your confidence speaking in your target language because you'll be consistently immersed in the language and establish natural language learning habits. If you choose the Super Sprint Challenge, you'll do 30 lessons a month for two months, and this is what you get back when you win the challenge. Or you can do the Sprint, which is a little less intense, with 15 lessons a month. Whether you want to learn Spanish, like me, or German, which I know many of you are interested in, French, English, or Business English, Lingoda offers classes from beginner to advanced levels, and classes are available 24-7, so you can fit them into your daily schedule no matter what. The classes are super immersive and interactive with only five students max, so you'll get a lot of practice and individual feedback, but it's totally in a safe space. I've never had a bad experience in the classes. Everyone always fully supports each other in their language learning progress. If you want to check out the Lingoda Sprint Challenge as well and get to that next level in your target language, make sure to click on the link below for more information and use my code FADY20 for a $25 discount on your Sprint registration. We've already talked about the German roots of the Oppenheimer story. Now let's talk about the other half of Barbenheimer. In case you missed it, the two movies both came out on the same day this year. So this whole concept of Barbenheimer became a thing, but yes, even Barbie originated in Germany. It all goes back to the launch of Germany's biggest newspaper, BIT, in 1952. BIT is a huge tabloid and criticized by many, but it seems like without it, Barbie wouldn't even exist. For their very first edition, they asked caricaturist Reinhard Beutin to create a black and white comic to fill some space. His first draft of a cute little baby didn't get approved by the editor, so he added a pout, long lashes, a ponytail, and a tall feminine body, and named the character Lily. The first comic of Lily at the Fortune Teller was a huge success, so they decided to publish it daily for the next nine years. Lily represented a confident woman in post-war Germany during the economic miracle of the 1950s. She was fashionable, cheeky, and openly talked about her various lovers. And a lot of the drawings showed her with minimal clothing at the beach or in the changing room. For promotional reasons, the newspaper decided to turn Lily into a real-life doll that came out in 1955 
under the name Bild Lily. The doll was sold in several European countries as well as overseas and it was available in a 30 centimeter and a 19 centimeter size. It was made of plastic with attached lashes, ear studs and pumps and due to the revolutionary doll making techniques that were used, it actually held three patents. Unlike other dolls, Lily was able to tilt her head in a flirty way and due to the way her legs were attached, they didn't sprawl when she was sitting, they always stayed parallel, which made her even more elegant. Even though Bild Lily was initially marketed to adults, the doll also became very popular among children who enjoyed dressing her in the various outfits that were sold separately. The doll became so popular that there was even a movie made about the character of Lily called Lily ein Mädchen aus der Großstadt, so Lily, a girl from the big city. Now it was only about a year after Bild Lily first came out that the American businesswoman Ruth Handler discovered the Lily doll during a trip to Europe. Supposedly, she had been wanting to create an adult fashion doll for quite a while, but her husband and the other directors at their toy company Mattel didn't really support the idea. Seeing the success of Bild Lily showed that the concept could work though, so when Handler returned from Europe, they started to redesign the doll and first introduced their Barbie doll in 1959, named after Handler's daughter Barbara. Now whether the idea for Barbie was stolen or it was just an inspiration as they say, I don't know. Fact is that Handler's company Mattel purchased the rights to Bild Lily a few years later to take it off the German market and allow for Barbie to be sold instead. And the rest is history, I guess. Okay, who of you has ever had a Fanta, or as we say in German, Fanta. It's a brand that's part of the Coca-Cola company, but it was in fact invented in Germany and the name goes back to the German word Fantasie, meaning imagination, which perfectly describes how Fanta came about because it was really created out of necessity. It all goes back to World War II when the supply of Coca-Cola syrup to Germany was heavily affected by the trade embargo that the US had established against the Nazi regime. By 1942, the supply had completely run out which is why the CEO of Coca-Cola Germany, Max Keit, was looking for ways to keep the company running, even without their flagship drink. Together with their chief chemist Wolfgang Schetelich, they developed a drink that was mainly made from byproducts, such as whey, which is a cheese byproduct, and apple pomace. And then they mixed it with sugar beets and different concentrated fruit juices from Italy and called it Fanta. Flavor-wise, it didn't really have a whole lot in common with Fanta today, but it kept the business running, even after the US joined the war in 1941 and the company was completely cut off from the Coca-Cola headquarters. In 1943 alone, 3 million cases of Fanta were sold in Germany. And what's interesting is that in a lot of cases, it wasn't even bought as a beverage, but it was used for cooking to add sweetness and flavor because sugar was severely rationed at the time. After the war, the Coca-Cola company regained full control over the German plant and the trademark to Fanta, but they actually discontinued the production in 1949. Until in 1955, a beverage company in Naples, Italy, had the idea to create an orange flavored drink, which was was then bought again by Coca-Cola in 1960, and that's the origin of the Fanta flavor that we all know today. Even though I should say that almost every country has their own version of Fanta. And I'm not just talking about the difference of, oh, American Coke is made with high fructose corn syrup, while in Mexico and Europe it's made with sugar. No, Fanta in the US tastes and looks completely different from Fanta in Germany, and that one's different from Fanta in Italy and Fanta in Russia and so on. In fact, there are over 200 different Fanta flavors worldwide, but at least according to Ben, the one in Germany is the best. That's pretty much all he drinks when we're in Germany. <laughs> and the last invention that you didn't know was German is the camera. Now, the official inventor of the camera is Joseph Nicephore Niepce from France. He created the first permanent photograph in 1826 after he had been spending years trying to find a way to capture the image of a camera obscura. That's the name of those original simple camera designs where you have some kind of darkened room, like a box with a small hole or lens through which an image is projected onto a wall. Those have been around for hundreds of years and have even been mentioned as early as 500 BC. And since the 
late 17th century, they had been used as an art tool by projecting an image onto a surface that could then be manually traced. But it wasn't until 1816 that Niepce constructed a prototype of his camera and then 10 years later figured out how to actually capture the image with an eight hour exposure and a process that he called heliography. This is the photograph that he captured on a pewter plate, the very first photograph, and it shows the view from his window at Le Gras in France. But did you know that the first person who envisioned a camera that would be small and portable enough for practical photography was actually a German? In 1685, so pretty early, the German author Johann Sahn described and drew both the camera obscura and the so-called magic lantern, as well as different projection types, lenses, reflectors, and so on in his book Oculus Artificialis. It was the first time that the idea of a lens cover was introduced, which was a crucial development in the history of the camera because it meant that the screen could be kept dark while the operator changed the slide. It just took another 150 years after Zahn published that book before technology caught up to the point where it was actually possible to build this. So granted, Germans only played a side role here, but I thought this was pretty cool and this wasn't all. Because about 90 years after the first photograph was taken, it was the German inventor Oskar Banach who developed the first 35 millimeter compact camera at the company Lights, the Leica, Lights Camera. Many of you are probably familiar with the brand Leica to this day. The first prototype, the Ur Leica, was developed in 1913, but due to World War I interfering here, the camera wasn't commercialized until 1925 as the Leica One. It was an immediate hit, which of course spawned a lot of competitors, such as the companies Contax and Kodak, also both from Germany, as well as Argus from Michigan or Canon from Japan. And today we all have a camera in our phone and our laptop and use it pretty much every single day. But what do you guys think? What other major German inventions deserve more attention? Let me know in the comments below. And of course, don't forget to like, subscribe and follow me on Instagram, TikTok and Facebook. If you wanna know why Germans and Americans sleep differently, just click here. And with that, thank you so much for watching and I hope I'll see you next time. Tschüss.